Hello there, a very good evening and welcome to another episode of The Role of Law where we are here to discuss the substance of the law. On the 1st of October, we celebrated Children's Day. Speaking on that day, the President said that his priority is to uh, make all citizens in Sri Lanka free from mental and physical poverty. He was specifically speaking about the children here in Sri Lanka. Now, when we speak about laws that afford different sorts of protection towards children, it's very important that everybody in Sri Lanka are aware of these laws because at the end of the day, it's not just the police force or the authorities that are supposed to enforce these laws and make sure that children in our country are protected. It is the duty and responsibility of us all to make sure that the future of our country, the children of our country, remain safe. And to discuss the laws that protect uh, children here in Sri Lanka and also how they can be applied uh, and to give our viewers out there a broad understanding of all of these matters, we have with us a senior lecturer from the Faculty of Law at the University of Colombo, Dr. Rose. Uh, a very good evening, Dr. Rose, and thank you very much for taking time off your busy schedule to attend our program. Good evening. So, Dr. Rose, to begin with, we have uh, a number of legislation that afford protection uh, to children in Sri Lanka. We also have uh, the National Plan of Action to Protect uh, Children uh, that runs from 2016 to 2020. Now, all of these measures are there according to the names that they've been given, of course, to protect children in our country. But how much, really, do our viewers know about these laws? Do you have a broad understanding? Well, stay tuned to this program, and at the end of it, you will. So let's start off with a look at the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, a broad overview of the provisions in the Act. The Prevention of Domestic Dr. Rose, when we speak about domestic violence, uh, people would think that you know it's maybe a quarrel between a husband and a wife because that's the most uh, pertinent form of domestic violence that at least we hear of uh, every day. But children too are, are a huge victim or they are potential victims of domestic violence. And since in this program we are specifying on children, how does the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act protect children in Sri Lanka? Yes. The Protection of Domestic, uh, Prevention of Domestic Violence Act recognizes or identifies a child as a person below the age of 18. We need to uh, understand that mm. uh, at the very beginning. And if a child becomes a victim of domestic violence, if or if a child becomes potential victim of domestic violence, then a, a person in whose custody, custody the child resides can make a complaint to the police station, hmm. to the nearest police station, hmm. or uh, anybody, a neighbor or, a, or, or anybody can make a complaint to the police station and then the police uh, can visit the place hmm. and inquire about the, the incident and uh, make a complaint to the, the magistrate's court. Hmm. So uh, under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, it is the magistrate's court that has the authority, the power to issue, uh, to inquire into and to issue a protection order hmm. and when it, the victim is a child, so it's, it, it can be the, the parent or the guardian uh, or any other uh, authority 
in, under whose custody the child resides hmm. or a, an authorized person belonging to the National Child Protection Authority or a police officer can make a uh, make a complaint to the magistrate's court for uh, requesting for the protection of the child. Hmm. When, when a child is the victim of domestic violence or a potential victim of domestic violence. So then the magistrate's court will inquire into the matter hmm. and issue a interim protection order and then if necessary a protection order. So when it comes to these protection orders, what really does it entail? A protection order. When the magistrate court issues a protection order, what sort of protection does it really give these children who are potential victims or victims of domestic violence? Yes, it can vary. It can it can order the the uh, perpetrator of the violence to stay away from the child, uh, and it can ask the the order the uh, perpetrator to uh, uh, be subjected to a med. Uh, medical or psychological or whatever uh, uh, order, it can vary depending on the incident or it can lead to a further lead to further inquiry where the magistrate's court will order the perpetrator to be uh, dealt with by the ordinary law. That is the penal law of the country. So it varies with the type of violence that the uh, the child is subjected to. Now, of course, the magistrate court is given the discretion as to either reward an interim protection order or a protection order or to even refuse it. Uh, what if the magistrate's court refuses it? What are the available courses of recourse? Usually, uh, the magistrate's court, the usual practice is the magistrate's court does not take these uh, domestic violence, uh, the protection order applications under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act the court does not take uh, seriously under normal circumstances. But when the victim is a child, mm. of course, the court takes serious notice of it. Mm. And because the child is a vulnerable person mm. and when, when the child is subjected to violence within the domestic sphere, of course, the court as the upper guardian of uh, all children, children uh, cannot uh, just disregard the application. Hmm. So the court uh, usually takes serious note of it and issues an interim protection order in the first instance hmm. and make an inquiry, order the police to do an inquiry and then if necessary, if the police says that uh, a, an issue of a protection order is necessary, the court will uh, order a protection order. Well, generally we expect a child who is in the custody of their parents to be safe because as we know in Sri Lankan we have, a, we have a close bond with our parents. Parents are very loving towards us. But does this Prevention of Domestic Violence Act limit to children who are only with their parents? What if uh, the parents of these children are no longer uh, among us and uh, they live with the relatives, guardians, uh, in any other place or even sometimes um, recently, there was uh, legislation being brought to bring down the minimum age of uh, employment to 16. Now, as you said, uh, the age of a child, according to this act, is below the age of 18. What if this child is at maybe his place of work and uh, maybe somewhere else, not in his house with his parents? Does, do these provisions apply? Can they still apply for a yeah. protection order? In order for the, pr the provisions of the Domestic Prevention of Domestic Violence Act to apply, you, the child or the victim does not have to be within the house, but the relationship between the child and the perpetrator the, or the alleged perpetrator mm. has to be a, a domestic relationship, a parent or a relative. Therefore, the act, law does not apply, this particular act does not apply when a child is being subjected to violence by uh, uh, say an employer, mm. even within a domestic sphere, say if a child is being employed as a domestic servant mm. and the, when the employer uh, abuses the child or uh, uses violence against the child, this particular act does not apply mm. because there is no domestic relationship between the child and the perpetrator. Mm. But if the child is under the custody of a third party, then there is a domestic kind of, say, 
the child lives with a relative mm. and the relative is the custodian mm. of the child, then the, the act applies. Dr. Rose, real quick before we move into uh, the next piece of legislation that we're planning on discussing on the role of law, practically application of these laws, how does it really work? Is it effective? Does it need reform? Uh, yes, it is effective. Uh, now, if I just mention a, uh, an experience that I had to undergo, uh, usually, as you just mentioned, uh, we in Sri Lanka in particular and in the Asian region think that children are safe in the hands of their parents, but not always. Mm. There has been, I have come across a, an incident where the mother of the child physically abused a five-year-old girl. Uh, because the child was seen by the mother as, an, as, a, as a threat to her uh, activities. So the, the mother had physically abused the child and then what I did was, I, I as, an, as a third completely outsider cannot make a complaint to the magistrate court, but what I did was to make a complaint to the police, the nearest police station and the nearest police station visited the place, mm. uh, arrested the, the mother and took the child also to the police station and they uh, proceeded under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act. Right. So, uh, let's move on to the next piece of legislation. Of course, uh, many of the offences here in Sri Lanka are contained in the Penal Code and the Penal Code has been amended on a number of times and some progressive amendments were seen uh, with regard to rape laws in Sri Lanka and also on the protection of children surrounding these matters, uh, specifically the 1995 uh, Amendment Act of the Penal Code and the 1996 Amendment Act of the Penal Code. Here are some of those provisions. Dr. Rose, the offense of obscene publications, we know we live in the digital age and um, pretty much privacy is a huge issue currently right now. And uh, when we see incidents that have been taking place, we see a lot of uh, obscene photographs and obscene uh, uh, films of children uh, being circulated on the internet and there is really uh, a very small narrow loophole to control this. Controlling uh, the internet is really not in our power in certain ways. But these offences, uh, as related to obscene uh, publications, does it really apply to even digital content that pass around? Yes, of course. Uh, if a child's image is used uh, even with the consent of the child, now this is the, the most important part. Now, children even though they are small, have the right to privacy. Mm. And it's a Im very important right of children. And unlike adults, children themselves can't protect their own uh, yeah. privacy. Mm. Therefore, the state, the parents, and as well as the state has a responsibility to protect children's privacy. Mm. So the penal code provisions, the latest amendments, make sure that nobody intrudes into the children's privacy. So, 
obscene publication of children's images either on TV uh, or on uh, uh, pre uh, newspapers, magazines or on Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever hmm. is illegal. Hmm. It is prohibited. It, it is an it is a criminal offence under the law of Sri Lanka. So, anybody who uses images, obscene images, hmm. even with the consent of the child, hmm. then it is an offence. And not only the publisher, but say for instance, if you use uh, an internet cafe to you uh, to uh, use uh, to, access. To, yeah, to access and also to make use of these pictures or to sexually harass a child using a public computer, then not only you commit an offence, but also the service provider, the owner of the internet yeah. cafe commits an offence, a penal offence hmm. under the, the criminal law of the country. Hmm. So, using a computer or a, or a digital device hmm. in, to uh, sexually abuse, sexually harass a child is an offence in Sri Lanka. And of course, this offence is punishable with a term of imprisonment between 2 to 10 years. Yes. It's a heavy uh, penalty. Yes. Uh, also speaking about, uh, you spoke about consent and you said that the consent of the child is r irrelevant in this matter. Uh, now, in the modern day, we see uh, children uninformed, lack of knowledge. They, with consent, they pass their own obscene photographs to maybe a loved one, a person who is close to them. Uh, does the possession of these obscene photographs also amount to an offence? Of course, it is an offence. Even now, as you say, there are so many thousands of incidents where girls, especially girls, uh, share their own uh, uh, nude and partially nude photographs with their boyfriends. And uh, boyfriends may be below the age of 18, still a child mm. or an adult does not matter irrespective of the age of the, the perpetrator. If anybody uses these obscene material, th now these are obscene material hmm. on Facebook or on WhatsApp or whatever hmm. commits an offence. Hmm. And even though the child has himself or herself has shared his own or her own uh, pictures, then the even then the perpetrator commits an offence. The per person who is in possession of these obscene yes. material. Yes, commits, commits an, an offence. And what you should do in such a occasion is to make a complaint. The parents can make a complaint to the police or to the CID straight away. Hmm. So, uh, Dr. Rose, uh, speaking about uh, the recourse that these people have, we see many instances, we even hear reports of uh, sometimes people going as far as suiciding. Uh, when their obscene photographs really start making the rounds on the internet. What are the possible avenues that these people can seek redress in such situations? Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a very important question and because it, these things happen very frequently now. What they can do, the parents or the guardians can do is straight away make a complaint to the CID hmm. because it is the CID rather than the police Hmm. who takes uh, action when it comes to uh, online material. Hmm. So, if, if, uh, if your daughter's uh, uh, nude pictures are used by a, by a man or a boy hmm. to threaten the girl, hmm. uh, then you can straight away make a complaint to the CID giving all the details. Hmm. And of course, the children also should be uh, made aware that using their own pictures is can cause them severe harm hmm. uh, and of course the, a complaint can be made to the CID. That is the, the best course of action. But here in Sri Lanka we see that people are sometimes find it, uh, people are ashamed to really go and file a complaint. How do we really get past that barrier? Is there any legal provisions to make these complaints uh, privately or any protection of privacy in that yes. front? Yes, yes. The National Child Protection Authority uh, has a hotline 1929 and you can make a telephone call and inform them. Hmm. They will ensure confidentiality hmm. and of course if you cannot access the CID there is always the uh, women and children's bureaus, children and women's desk in the police stations. Hmm. You can go there and make a complaint to the, the women and children's desk hmm. and they are bound to maintain confidentiality. Hmm. Um, and 
Now, there is no point of thinking that disclosing your information uh, will lead you to further shame and all that because if you do not do that, your I mean extremely personal material will be online and when, when your pictures are online, there is no end to it. Hmm. There is no end to and there is no in there is no way in which you can stop, stop it. Hmm. those pictures getting spread out. Hmm. So, the best course of action is to make a complaint. Hmm. Also, um, let us move on to the um, next provision in the penal code, uh, 308A section, uh, which is uh, which deals with actually the cruelty to children. Now, when it comes to cruelty to children, uh, is this a similar provision to domestic violence or is there a broader application of this? It is broader because the cruelty can be perpetrated by your own family member, mm. then it falls under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act as well. Mm. But cruelty can be by a third party, say children are, you know, even though it is against the law, children are employed in domestic, as mm. domestic servants and, and the employers most of the time mm. are cruel to children. Mm. So, then such people also are covered under the uh, under this provision of if, the penal code. If you would have been following the news recently, there was this news story where a boy had gone out to sea with a group of fishermen and he was uh, severely abused on that ship and when he came back he couldn't even walk. Would this be an incident that would fall under this offence? Not under this, so this is a, a lesser offence. Cruelty to children is a lesser of offence but it's, it falls under the sec, under sexual harassment uh, of the oh, penal yes. code. Hmm. So, it's a, it carries a severe uh, penalty, severe hmm. uh, punishment. Also, another area uh, that law covers and is not much discussed is the laws that covers incest here in Sri Lanka. Now, although maybe in um, the urbanized areas, we don't hear too many incidents about these, there are many incidents in rural parts of the island where these incidents even go unreported. What does the law have to say about that? Yes, incest is sexual intercourse between uh, relatives. Hmm. Relatives can be by marriage or by blood. Hmm. Uh, so, as you correctly points out, incest do take place in Sri Lanka in rural places as well as urban. Hmm. Um, but mostly in rural areas hmm. because uh, people do not know that they commit an offence and people do not know that when say for example when a father uh, rapes his own daughter, people do not know that uh, that it is an offence and, and that they can make a complaint. Hmm. Uh, so, they, they do not take action. They hmm. think that it is a family affair and the father also there are certain instances where the father and uh, even the brother, there are hmm. I mean, so, so many occasions where family members think that they own their girls. So, they can do anything with their own girls. That is wrong. It is it's an offence and it is, it is a very serious offence. So, the law provides for that, hmm. law covers that it is incest and it carries a very severe, uh, you, the perpetrator can be imprisoned for a, for a term of 20 years. Mm, 5 to 20 years. Yes. So, the, so it is a serious offence and it still occurs in rural areas especially because people think, I have myself heard that people think that they own their children in also in situations where the mother uh, uh, goes abroad leaving the children to the father's care and the father uh, things that, uh, so as, as I said, he owns his daughter, so he can do whatever he, he can want to hmm. with his own children, hmm. which is wrong, which is an offence, a serious offence. Well, protecting children physically and mentally, we discussed that. But of course, we need to ensure that children in this country have a future. And the only guarantee that a child would have a good future is the provision of education. Now, there are laws in Sri Lanka that govern this as well. There is a mandatory period where children have to go to school and this is governed by a gazette. These are the regulations that have been imposed by that gazette.
So, as I pointed before, Dr. Rose, I think you'd agree with me that education is also as important as ensuring the protection of children, physically and mentally. Am I correct? Yes, of so, course. So, uh, speaking about this Gazette notification, it makes it mandatory for parents uh, to provide education to their children. And um, if parents are not in a position to provide education to their children, then it's the state's responsibility? Yes, it is. The, the education ordinance of Sri Lanka provides for free public education. Hmm. So, children are primarily the, the, the parents' responsibility. Hmm. And then, when the parents fail to provide, to, to uh, discharge their responsibility, it becomes the state's responsibility. Hmm. Because the primary uh, the holders or the, the res responsible party is the state. Hmm not the parents. So, mm. when the parents fail to send their children to, to school, mm. of course, the ch parents are bound to send their children to school at least until the children become 16. Mm. But when the parents fail due to uh, poverty or whatever reason, mm. then it becomes the state's responsibility. Mm. So, the state must, must make sure through the, the monitoring committees and school committees and all that, that the children in that in a particular area attend children who are below the age of 16 at least hmm. attend school hmm. and and when and there's a punishment for for failing to send one's children to school no, no, actually there's regulation no punishment. 19 says that yes. every parent who contravenes the provisions of regulation 2 shall be guilty of an offense yes it is but an no sanction offense. no but no sanction because when the parents fail the responsibility transfers to the state. So, the state must make sure that, the, that it provides in order to ensure hmm. that children attend school. Hmm. So, the provision may be in terms of money or in terms of what other facilities or whatever, hmm. but the state cannot uh, get away from its responsibility to ensure that children every child under the age of 16 attend free, free public edu gets the free public education because state has the sri lanka as a state party to the un convention on the rights of the child hmm. has pledged to ensure universal education so recently we had a story on uh, news first where it was a story of a brave child who really took a decision under the age of 16 of course his uh, mother is uh, suffering with a uh, nervous disorder and this child is taking care of the mother. Uh, there is no father in the family. So then, when it comes to a situation like this, how far does the state's responsibility extend to uh, making sure that children of this nature do receive an education? The child is the is primary responsibility for the child is the state rest with the state hmm. and when the child cannot uh, attend school due to a domestic uh, difficulty like this hmm. then the state should intervene make sure that the mother is taken care of hmm. by social welfare that is where we i mean we need a state to intervene when we cannot handle our own affairs hmm. so the state must make sure that uh, the mother is take the hmm. the patient the mental patient is taken care of so that the child attends school hmm. otherwise there's no point of having a, a, an education ordinance since 1939 we have this ordinance hmm. and if we can't make sure that children attend school doctor we're in the final few minutes of the show so i'll ask you this question how far practical are these provisions in the gazette are they actually being practiced no, the laws are there, but the implementation is the problem. The institutional mechanism in this country is not adequate to ensure the rights of the children which are guaranteed in laws. We have laws, we have regulations, all these are good, but the institutional mechanism is not uh, geared towards the implementation of the laws. So, ultimately, the children suffer. Is it just not geared or is it not robust enough? Maybe <laughs> robust enough, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Rose, uh, for coming on our show, The Role of Law. Of course, we have a very limited time, as I pointed out to you before. Just 
uh, a span of 30 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, of course, though, for coming on our show, uh, taking time off your busy schedule. Uh, and also, thank you very much to all our viewers out there for tuning in to The Role of Law, where we discuss the substance of the law and put it out in plain terms so that uh, everyone in Sri Lanka would be aware of the laws that govern them. Until uh, we meet again, take care and God bless.